So uh, it's good to see you, and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to interview you. Thank you, Greg. Sure, it's a pleasure. Some questions for you, so I can better get to know you and also members of our church, Summerland Church. Sure. Uh, to start off, we've invited you to uh, come and offer a workshop on beginner's meditation on September 17th, later this year. And we're, we're thrilled to, that we'll be having you that, on that day. Wonderful. I look forward to coming down to Long Island and meeting you all. I hope the weather is as nice then as it is today. <laughs> yes. Well, that's in, where is that? In September now. So we'll be significantly much improved over the winter. Right. So um, how long have you been teaching meditation? Well, I've been teaching meditation for about 40 years, a little over 40 years now. Wow, that's, that's quite a long haul. Various iterations, various forms of it. The funny thing is that recently I've, I've had this epiphany, maybe a small e epiphany. The, the idea is that the whole world has changed. The whole world has sped up. There's a whole new needs. The people's needs have changed. And meditation itself, as good as it is, it has not really changed to, to meet those needs. And that's what I realize what I'm offering now is a way to meditate in pace with the world and still get the same or better results than before. Right. Great. Great. Why did you try to meditate? What, how did that come about? Well, I started out back in the 70s, early 70s, and perhaps like a lot of people back then, who we, we hardly ever even knew what meditation was. Right. And uh, I was a pretty skeptical high school student somewhere in there. And then just started to hear a little bit, read a few books here and there. The, the turning point for me was I was a freshman in college, Frank, and uh, my parents were in a car accident and they, oh. uh, they passed over. They didn't survive the accident. Oh, wow. wow. And for the next probably year or so, I just was really at sea trying to get myself back to some semblance of, of a life. And nothing really was working. And then one day in college, there was a sign on the door that said uh, meditation. And I said, well, I have nothing to lose. I'll try this. And when I started to meditate, I suddenly felt some uh, relief, some inner peace. Let's say you're outside and it's raining. And then you stand on the porch under the awning. It's still raining out, but you're not getting wet anymore. Right, right. And so that's really, to me, what meditation was. It was, okay, this whole thing happened in my world and everybody's affected that I know. And at the same time, I'm still able to have some sort of peace inside of me. So it wasn't the whole answer, but at least it gave me some breathing room. Oh, sure. If this works for me, let me share it with other people too. Sure, sure. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What can you expect from your beginning beginner meditation course? What can people expect? Sure. That's a, that's a wonderful question. And a lot of people, I, I don't know, have you heard this from people? I can't meditate. I can't stop my thoughts or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. So that 40 years later and everybody I hear is still saying that. And so that's the first thing you can expect that you will be able to meditate even if you have thoughts. And that's, that's really a myth in and of itself. You can expect to actually feel some relief some ease, some uh, energy, some feel some shift towards something you're looking for within 60 seconds, within the first few minutes of the practice. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a bold claim, but it's, it's, simple, it's, thrilling. it's thrilling to be able to say that. <laughs> yeah, Because yeah. it works. Um, what if people cannot keep thoughts out of their head? How, how can they still meditate? Well, see, there's, there's the, the myth. The myth is that you, to meditate, you have to keep thoughts out of your head. Yeah. And at best, at best, Frank, that would be the end goal, not the beginning goal. That's like saying, yeah. okay, you want to climb Mount Everest, so just go up Mount Everest today. Yeah. You, start, you start with a walk, then you walk yeah. up a hill. Then you go up uh, the White Mountain, and then you go up you know, a bigger mountain, and you, you work toward it. But the reality is that in my experience, my humble experience is that it's not that you have thoughts or you don't have thoughts. It's that whether your thoughts are harmonious, loving, self-loving thoughts or, or negative, 
self-defacing uh, thoughts. And what I help you do is release those and replace those self-limiting beliefs uh, through the meditation. That's a very self-empowering then. That totally, uh, that you'd really hit the nail on the head. Everyone can meditate. Everyone can take control of their life. A great tool. Why do you call your meditation method instant energy and healing through the heart? Well, the two key words there are you get instant energy, which is everybody wants more energy these days. Yeah. And everybody wants instant from instant oatmeal to Instagram. And, um, and healing through the heart is because to me, everything is in the heart. If, you, if we can have more self-love, I feel that is the solution to virtually everything from, from our health to our political views, to our uh, economic issues, compassion in the world, world peace. And, and I was shown this. I was in the Amazon rainforest. I had the great fortune of going on a visit with a group there. And we met with a shaman and we had a ceremony. And in that ceremony, spirit actually came down and blew into my heart. And everything just sort of opened up for me. And I said, oh, I can do that. And I came home and I started to do that for people. And they would call me the next day and say, I feel better. I was practicing Ayurvedic medicine before that. And people would feel better in three days, but to feel better in one day, that was revolutionary. And now I have it down over the past uh, 10 years to, well, from one day to one minute. <laughs> wow, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, people, people really take that in that those advantages because as everyone knows, it's just a fast-paced world now. So. Right. right. We, need, we need that. You know, we've got our phone with us for instant updates, right? The phone's in updating us instantly. If we feel uh, an alert coming, uh-oh, I'm picking up some stress, or let me clear it out like that. So. Great. Great. Um, these days, people are so busy. i continue with that theme. How do people find the time to meditate? Right. That's, uh, that's one of the biggest issues that, that this method addresses, Frank, that we don't really have that much time to meditate. And maybe on the weekends we do, and, or if we're meditating and we're sitting there with the, the noisy thoughts saying, I'm wasting my time. In the course, I teach everything from a, a 60 second meditation or, or less to you could just, ex I have various versions of that that you could practice longer, but it it's involves some sort of action. We need to act more these days. The world has shifted, it's sped up, and I, I personally feel that we're moving into a, a golden age, an age of harmony and compassion and, and love and enlightenment, and we need to create that world if for ourselves, and, and, and then, of course, it happens for everybody. And so with meditations, there's meditations that we can do in our active life. So we don't have to worry about stopping. We can, if you're at work, you can't say, okay, boss, or you can't say employees, hold on, I'm going to go and meditate for an hour in my little man cave, and then I'll come back. But we don't have that time. So we must yeah. be able to find some way to do that. And fortunately, by grace, I've been able to discover a way. That's wonderful. You've adapted it to our times. Yes. Great. Yes. Everything evolves. The meditation needs to evolve with it. Uh, can you tell me some of the benefits of meditation? Well, the, sure. The, there's all sorts of research. Fortunately, if you go to the PubMed website, which is the government research website, meditation improves concentration and memory. If you're studying, it's helping the heart. It's calming the stressors. Uh, we have a vagus nerve that runs from our brain down into our gut, which is the second brain. And that's if our brain, if we're thinking nervousness, we transmit that down to our gut brain and that gets nervous. And modern science and ancient Ayurveda are saying the same thing now, that the cause of most physical conditions is due to poor digestion. And if mm -hmm. stress is the cause of most nervousness getting into our digestive system, right. that's another benefit for meditation. And then there's the other side, which is joy and peace and love and, and Enjoy. Did I mention joy? <laughs> Can't get enough of that. <laughs> Thank you. To be kind of more specific, what is the value of meditation for members of our church, some related church? For people of the, the spiritualist churches, one of the core principles is connecting with life after life, right. connecting with spirit, connecting with angels, connecting with guides. And meditation is that which connects us with our own inner spirit, 
which is the ultimate, if you think of the oneness, if you believe God is one, spirit is one, we discover that ultimately internally. And so once we discover it internally, gradually we start to realize, oh, it's external too. When I love myself more, automatically I see the love in you. And what we see in others is only a reflection of what we feel in our own hearts. Sure, sure. So for the spiritualist, meditation, I would say, is essential to know ourselves and to become better psychic mediums. And if that's uh, not the key issue for somebody, then just to be a more loving person to ourselves and to our uh, community, our families. Is there a good age to begin meditation? Wow. You know, there's different types of meditations. There's actually case studies that found that when mothers are sitting in a room meditating, they get up, they walk in the other room, the baby is sitting in a corner meditating. It's so natural that they're connected. I think once you hit the grade school, kindergarten, first grade, that's probably a good time to start. And there's actually case studies around the world now in schools where they're having children with social challenges, behavioral challenges, or grade issues. And instead of sending them to detention room to punish them, they're sending them to a meditation room and their lives are transforming. It's like, wow, they're opening up. What a great idea. I love that. And and of course, uh, children are at the formative years. So the earlier that they learn these techniques, the better for them. Isn't that amazing, Frank? 40, 50, 60 years ago, when I was a kid, we didn't have the word meditation. We didn't have the word monk in our lexicon, per se. I mean, it was there, but not to the degree that we know it now. Now there's a holistic center and a yoga center on every corner, practically. Mm-hmm. The world has really shifted, and it's so available for everybody now. It's very good. You are a number one Amazon bestselling author. Have you written in a book specifically about meditation? That's a good question. Well, I I wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, which is the essence of all uh, Vedic philosophy from India. Thousands of books, the Upanishads, Puranas, and all kinds of literature has been written. And the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of it all. And there's some wonderful commentaries. Yogananda wrote one, and Shivananda wrote one, and on and on. And my students for years were asking me to write a copy. And I said, why? There's so many good, good versions. And then one day, one of my students said, you know, the commentaries talk about, they give examples about that time, you know, bows and arrows and chariots. And I don't use a chariot to get to work. I'm a Christian. And how does this, uh, this Chris, Krishna's teaching relate to my religion? How does it relate to a nine to five job? And then the light bulb went off in my head and I said, wow, okay. So I do see there's a need for that type of a a commentary. So I did write the Bhagavad Gita for modern times. Okay, that's great. People can find it. And I I just wrote a book called 21 Days of Joy, which is a form of meditation on joy. I'm always keeping my ears open. So if I start hearing what you're asking for, some specific way to present a book in meditation, I'm more than happy to write it. I'll, I'll look for that new book. Thank you. Thank you for informing me. And actually, if you go to my website, orangecowboy.com, I have 21 days of meditation. Science says if you do something new for 21 days, you create new neural pathways and they become second nature. So I started there and it wound up 61 days. Every day, it's like a one or two minute meditation and you could just watch it for free. It's a free online course. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Yeah. Something to look for. You also offer Ayurvedic and holistic living courses. Right. And energy and trans healing. Can you explain what you do in these topics? These natural tips for healing, Ayurvedic or just general holistic life. Our bodies are our temples, as as we've heard. And to support a, a healthy life, to support a spiritual life, to just to feel better when we eat better, we feel better. And so I have a course in really basic things that anybody can do today. One, If you just do one of these things, I'll tell you one of the tips you can switch from white sugar to a whole cane sugar or maple syrup or honey. You will feel yourself feel better from that. And it's tough because they put white sugar in everything these days, but yeah. So right. tips like that. Then we go into aromatherapies and color therapies to address our moods. I just started teaching a yoga class again after a long, long time. Along those lines, it's a, let your body tell you which pose it needs at this moment instead of us telling the body. 
Yeah. And then the, the trance healing is just, that's another benefit of meditation is you go deeper, you start to live in trance more and more and more. And that is where, like mediumship is where I get out of the way. I'm the medium in between the living on the other side and the living in this world. And it's not me that's coming up with answers. The loved ones, the spirits, the angels are, are saying things and I'm passing them on. In the same way, that's trance healing, where I get the healing messages or the healing shoots through me from the healing angels, the ascended masters, to a person locally or by distance. I was just doing a reading the other day. This person was on vacation and they couldn't meet on the video like this. They couldn't even be on the phone. So they just texted me what they wanted. And uh, it was some question about their son. And then the son not only spoke to me, but he spoke through me. And I just wrote it down in quotes. And I said to him afterwards, this boy energy, I said, now give me some evidence to share with your family so they know that I'm not just making this up. Right, right. And I got the blue lollipop. She goes, oh my God, that's his favorite. He loves blue lollipops. <laughs> wow. That's evidential, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm big on evidential mediumship. That's, I think it's the future. I feel that mediumship is starting to come into its own its next wave of, and, and a huge self-respect because there are so many teachers out there that are really putting that evidential mediumship, attaching it to it now. So people will start to expect more. These ideas, trans healing and trans mediumship, they tie into the history of spiritualism. I mean, that, it goes it's, throughout that's right. history. So that's wonderful. Yeah, exactly. And, and then the other thing that, uh, which is sort of a takeoff on all of this together, again, this is something that the parents have asked for, is I do a psychic kids and parents day camp. My first one is uh, set up already for the summer out in Erie, Pennsylvania for three hours. The kids are being born more and more psychic. And mm -hmm. It sounds great, but they have issues. First, they have, they're have they so sensitive, their health may be a problem. Right. The second is social. Their parents may be afraid of this, or the kids at school may tease them. And then the third is, once you take care of those two issues, let's develop your psychic gifts. Let's play some psychic games now. So that's the third thing that I'm doing. Um, that's wonderful, because we're finding more and more people coming to our church who have some connection to spirit and is sort of unnerved by it. And to me, they're not grounded. They need to be, right. you know, grounded in their body and their physicality. Um, it's great to be psychic, but you, you need to be here now also. And it sounds like me your meditation techniques will help these people. Yes, connecting to your heart and then hearing your heart. And then from that, you hearing spirit. It's a major way to go into this. And there's some, the research is there actually now from heart math to do heart-based meditations. And then as an adjunct to that is the, the healthy lifestyles and the psychic day camp. Yeah, you bring up a great point. There's so many great psychics. They're smoking, they're drinking, they're, they're really not taking care of themselves. And you know, there's no block to connection to spirit, but some of the uh, top psychics that I've talked to have told me it just in the last year that as they've stopped drinking and smoking, their gifts have become amplified. So they're yeah. here and they're actually as good as they are, they're getting even better as psychic mediums. People that are beginners to anything, they often ask, are there any dangers to it? Can you talk about that? Any issues that might be in any way whatsoever dangerous, <laughs> deleterious to someone? meditation dangers of meditation yeah. you might you might become uh, extra loving of yourself <laughs> well i mean i in theory in, if you have a very forceful based meditation i suppose anything you force in life has has potential side effects to it but if you're listening to your heart which sounds funny it has not been emphasized in the world for a long time we've been in a dark age you know, love it's like saying is there a downside to loving yourself or loving loving somebody love i mean real love but not i'm going to love you so i'll feel better about myself that's not really love but when you just love you see a baby for the first time or you have a, a pet puppy or you you love yourself or you love your spouse it's that's the oneness Love is oneness, and that's there can be no side effects to oneness. It's only in duality that second comes along, the opposites. If you go and you do a lot of psychic stuff, then what's going to happen is you're going to swing the other way and be ungrounded. But if you're listening to your heart, it's not so much about I'm going to be a psychic as much as I'm going to be in spirit connection. And right. then whatever spirit brings to me, as long as I stay in my oneness, 
I'm the lighthouse. I'm the shining the love. Right. Great explanation. You hear about people who are fear-based, and most people would say fear causes separation. So your techniques through the heart will, it, it sounds like it would naturally dissipate someone's you know, fears. Exactly. Exactly. Fear is what if a negative. I'll say, well, what if a positive? Why don't we just flip that around? <laughs> Right. So what if a negative is what frank it's it's undermining ourselves mm-hmm. i have a friend a dear friend and gave him a, a mediumship reading brought in his grandfather who i, I never met right. and he gave him all sorts of great evidence and a few months later my friend was saying something oh when you're dead you're dead i said no when you're dead you're alive he goes well that's your belief i go well but you just heard from your grandfather yeah. and he spent five minutes trying to figure out why that might not have really been what he experienced. And I said, well, that's, that's a very long, you're taking a long way around to try and <laughs> talk yourself out of what you experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. yeah. It's the best life being connected to spirit. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> well, those were my questions. And you answered them all, and uh, people will gain a lot from this interview. Summerland Church of Light uh, in Hopog, Long Island, New York. Summerland Church of Light. I love that. Summer. So life, life is Summerland. Is that it? Your life is in Summerland. <laughs> well, you may or may not know, uh, spiritualists they don't call heaven heaven. It's off. They use often use the term Summerland. So okay, I did not know that. The old spiritualist that they would call it Summerland. I love that. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for talking with me, Frank, and uh, look forward to meeting you, all the folks from your church, and anybody, everybody's welcome to come. Connect with me on uh, orangecowboy.com if you have any other questions. Okay, will do. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Frank. Thank, Thank you. you. Joy, joy, joy.